joined us so far. And we'll probably just wait a few more minutes to give people time to log in, but I just wanted to remind you all of a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is the fourth webinar in our ongoing Listen and Learn educational series where every month we focus on a different ear or hearing related topic. And our goal really is to educate and inform and answer any questions you may have during this live interactive session. Um, if you'd like to watch any of our previous sessions, you can download them from our website. It's at the bottom of the screen. It's www.eardoctor.org backslash events. Um, you can also see um, other uh, webinars that we've done and the ones that are upcoming as well. And you can share them um, obviously with anybody who's interested. And next month we have a special presentation by Dr. Jack Showett. It's entitled, Do You Love Your Hearing Aids? And during this session, um, Dr. Showett will be providing an overview of hearing loss. Um, he's gonna review some of the current options available, but he's really gonna focus on the new ear lens hearing solution, which was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 inventions in 2020. Uh, the ear lens is really the definition of cutting edge hearing technology. So please feel free to join us um, and stay tuned for more information on how to register. So just a few more housekeeping items before I turn it over. Um, during this session, your audio and video will be turned off just so that everyone can easily hear the speakers. We'd also like to encourage you to use the chat function if you have a question, um, you can post it anytime during the presentation. And at the end of uh, both presentations, the speakers will be happy to answer all of your questions. And one, li one last item, um, if we look at the next screen, we've enabled live captioning for this presentation. So if your Zoom account has this feature turned on and you're not seeing a live transcription on your screen, simply click on the live transcript button to the right side of the toolbar along the bottom, and then you can select enable auto transcription. And then you should see the transcription appear on the bottom of your screen. Okay. I think that covers all the housekeeping items and it looks like we have several more people joining us. So let's go ahead and get started. So today's topic is entitled, is it time for a cochlear implant? Uh, a patient's perspective. And we have two speakers joining us today. The first is Julie Husting, who is a former patient of Dr. Jack Shohet. And she's the author of I Dare to Dream, which chronicles her journey with hearing loss and cochlear implants. The second speaker today is Jacqueline Bybee, who is a clinical audiologist and director of research at Choate Ear Associates. She'll talk a little bit more about hearing loss and when to consider hearing aid accessories, as well as a cochlear implant. So without further ado, I'd be honored to turn it over to our first presenter, author and patient, Julie Husting. Go ahead, Julie. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to take you on my hearing journey. So when I was a teenager in high school, I was sitting at the kitchen table with my mom and I was reading a book and all of a sudden she got really angry with me. It was, turns out she was talking to me and she thought I was just being a rebellious teenager and ignoring her. But in fact, I had no idea she was talking to me, couldn't hear her. And that's when we found out that that was the beginning of my journey as a hard of hearing individual. Now my poor mom, she'd been through this before with my brother, Steve. His hearing loss started when he was about five and hearing loss runs in my family, I'm afraid. So Steve was always the deaf one in the family and he was always way worse than I was, or so I thought. He wore hearing aids for as long as I've known him and I wore hearing aids in both ears since that time in high school. So since I had good hearing for so long and before losing my hearing, I always seemed to do so much better than he did. I did just fine with my hearing aids. I'm a pretty positive person and I always preferred to concentrate on what I could do rather than dwell on what I couldn't do. So as I can no longer do certain things, I kind of filed those things away in that file cabinet in my mind. I adapted to my hearing loss pretty well. I became an expert lip reader and an even better actor. And actually, I think all hearing impaired people are pretty great actors. We are really good at mimicking what we see on other people's faces. If they smile, we smile. If they're sad, we're sad. And oftentimes, we have no idea why. Then in July of 2012, my hearing aid audiologist, Wendy, was fitting me for new hearing aids. And she had me take a hearing test, and she told me that I had a profound hearing loss. I was absolutely shocked when she told me that. I was doing just fine after all. 
And she then told me that I might want to consider getting a cochlear implant. Well, she couldn't possibly be talking about me. Surely must, she must be thinking about my brother, Steve, because he was the deaf one in the family, not me. But of course, that wasn't true. She'd never even met Steve. Well, Steve and I knew about cochlear implants. In fact, I tried to get Steve to get one in the past. But we were both under the mistaken impression that it was going to cost $50,000 to $100,000 to get one. And I also thought it meant that I would be hearing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I wasn't really sure that I wanted that. You see, I liked having a nice, quiet night's sleep. At the time, my boyfriend snored something fierce, and no way did I want to have to listen to that every night. I might kill him. And I also seen people, old pictures of people with cochlear implants. And I didn't want to have this huge thing sticking out of my head or have to wear this big thing around my neck. So neither one of us really looked into it very seriously. We were just fine after all. So when I told Wendy that we didn't want to pay for it, she told me that insurance covers it. So that all of a sudden gave me something to think about. See, when you can't think of do things, you put those away in that file cabinet in your mind, far, far away into that deep, dark corner. There's no use thinking about them. Otherwise, you simply have too many pity parties, you go into depression. You don't dream about being able to do things that you're never going to be able to do again. It is the way it is, and, and you move on. So I decided maybe it was time to open that file cabinet and think about all those things that I can no longer dream, do. Is it really possible to dare to dream? So then when there was a full carload of people, I'd miss a lot of the conversation. I might catch part of it, but not all of it. And catching part of a conversation may as well be missing the whole thing. If you miss the beginning, you don't know what the topic is. And if you miss the end, you don't know how the story turned out. So it's like hearing part of a joke. It's really not very good. So oftentimes I'd simply gaze out the window and I'd just think my own thoughts and ignore what everybody else was saying. And I'm also a Stampin' Up! demonstrator. I have mon monthly stamp nights where I teach people how to use um, rubber stamps to make greeting cards and other items. And if you can see this, but this is kind of what we do in, in my class. So I've been doing that for 28 years. And I love stamping, but I couldn't stamp and read lips at the same time. And I also couldn't understand my customers very well when they were all chatting away and having a good time. So again, I just kind of go off in my own little world while everybody else was chatting and sharing their news. And I tended to be a pretty quiet person in those instances, which really wasn't me at all. I used to go on, down to the movies every week and I stopped going long ago when I could no longer understand what was being said. I started going again after my father got Alzheimer's because it was the one thing that he loved to do. So I went because it made him happy. Fortunately, he was an action movie, so they could pretty much follow along with the plot without actually understanding the movie. And I counted just how many words I could understand once. 15 words. Not sentences, just words. And I like to hike with my friends as the screen shows. And if it was just the two of us on the hike, then I could easily read lips and follow along with no problem. But if a group went, I couldn't understand what was being said we'd be too spread out on the trail. So as I thought of those things, you know, I, I had a really good cry. And doggone it, I, I wanted to understand people when we were hiking or in the car or stamping or sitting around a kitchen table eating dinner. I wanted to join in those conversations. I wanted to be a part of it. I was tired of just conversing with myself inside my head when everybody else was having a good time. So maybe, just maybe, Wendy was on to something. Dare to dream? Heck yeah, it was possible then. So I talked to Steve about it and I told him what said, Wendy said about the insurance. So being the good sister that I am, I decided I would let Steve be the guinea pig. And if he could hear well with the cochlear implant, then I would get one. So I asked Wendy if she could give me the number of any patients that she had that had a cochlear implant. So she referred me and Steve and his wife, Shirley, and I met with the gentleman and his wife. We were there for only one hour, but that one hour changed our entire life. It seemed that he could do 
all of the things that we no longer could. And his wife was really happy with his progress and how much her life had changed as well. And I was able to see what a cochlear implant actually looked like. And it was no idea as bad as what I had in my mind, the next spring shows. So then all bets were off and my brother and I had a race to see who could get the cochlear implant first. And it was then that I met the miracle worker, Dr. Shohat. He gave me the greatest gift I have ever received in my life, and I will be forever grateful to him and to Advanced Bionics, which is the company that made my implant. I'm truly blessed to live in this day and age and in this time of life-changing technology. And all along, I thought I was doing just fine. But what I didn't realize, and what most people with hearing aids don't, is that there's a big difference between hearing and understanding. I could hear just fine with my hearing aids. They were plenty loud, but I couldn't understand with them. Hearing aids make sounds louder, but they don't make speech clear. I was actually using my eyes to understand and not my ears. I could hear just fine as long as I could see the person's mouth that I was listening to. But if they turned away or if it was dark, all of a sudden I couldn't hear anymore. So my brilliant surgeon performed my first surgery on October 18th, 2012. Now between my surgery and my activation, which is when they turn it on for the first time, it was definitely time to really dream. I made a wish list of all the things that I hoped to hear someday. And as I went about my days, I began looking in the world in a totally different way. I looked at them as a hearing person. When I went on a hike, I asked my friend if she heard any birds. I couldn't see any birds. And she said she could, and she told me where they were, even though we couldn't see them. So birds went on my wish list. When I went to Disneyland, I really thought about all the songs, uh, the sounds that I couldn't make out. There were a lot of characters on rides and songs being under, um, sung that I could never understand. So those things went on my wish list. So I found out after my cochlear implant that there are birds all over the place and they all sound different. And there's music being played everywhere at Disneyland. I never knew that. And I finally understood one of the pirates. And while I expected magical words of pirate wisdom, what he actually told me was to keep my hands and arms inside the boat. I was activated three weeks later on November 6th and I had prepared for the worst. I had done a lot of research and I knew that it was not unusual to hear only beeps for speech or the wah, wah, wah of Charlie Brown's teacher. So I was pretty ecstatic when I actually understood what my, audio, my audiologist, Cheryl Tanita, was saying to me. She sounded like she was on helium or a munchkin from the Wizard of Oz. And my dad sounded like a five-year-old girl, but I didn't care. I could hear it worked. My life would never be the same again. I could dare to dream. So when we got in the car on the way home, I sat in the front seat with my mom and my dad sat in the back. I had him read signs to me to see that if, if I could understand him. And I could. I could understand all of the signs that he read to me. So we went home and I had him read a word list to me and I was able to understand a lot of that too. And this was about reading lips. I was overjoyed. And by the way, I had given that list, that word list to Steve to show him a form of rehab to do. He was still waiting for doctor's appointments and insur insurance approval at that time. So he told me that that word list was very easy and quite boring. He said that he had Shirley read the words to him and he got them all right. Well, I knew that couldn't possibly happen with his hearing aids. So I asked him if he was looking at her while he read the words. And he said, well, of course. So I gave him a look like, hello. And he slapped himself on the forehead when he realized what he had done. And I asked him how easy and boring it would be if he had his back to her and, and wasn't reading her lips. And then he was amazed that I could understand those words. They all of a sudden got a whole lot harder. So getting a cochlear implant, it's not a quick fix. It's not like putting glasses on and you can see or popping in a hearing aid. It takes a lot of time and effort for the brain to learn how to use it. It's kind of like my mom when she got a knee implant. 
she had a knee replacement surgery. So she came home with a walker and then she had to do a lot of rehab and then she moved up to a cane and then she had to do a lot more rehab and then she could walk. She had to train her brain how to use her new knee. And it's the same thing with the cochlear implant. With a bit of rehab and patience and persistence, the beeps and the wah-wah-wahs and the munchkin voices go away and speech becomes much more clear. So I'm now hearing with my ears again and no longer with my eyes. I'm able to do so many things that I never thought I was going to be able to do again. I remember the first hike I went on, and it was about a month after I was activated. Now, I try not to get my hopes too high because I knew that it could take up to a year or two that I could understand before reading, uh, understand without reading lips. Well, it was a big group and sure enough, nothing changed. I heard the voices of my friends chattering all around me, but I didn't know what they were saying. But after a few miles, a friend joined us and we were standing in a circle taking a break when he started to speak. I was looking away and I realized that I was understanding what he was saying. He sounded just like the guy on my audio books that I was using for rehab. So we hiked a little bit longer, and his was the only voice that I could clearly understand without reading lips. That is until the last mile. On the very last mile, there were only a few of us left. Everybody else had gone home. Well, that last mile was the best mile that I've ever hiked in my entire life. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I could clearly understand the two guys behind me, which my friend was one of them. And I could understand the girl that was walking next to me. And I'm not talking just about a phrase here or there. I'm talking about an an entire conversation moving from topic to topic. I had never been so excited to hear a conversation about politics before in my life. I was absolutely ecstatic. It truly was a miracle. I now go to the movies regularly. And there are caption devices available at the movies now, in case you didn't know that. And in the beginning, I use them, but I no longer need them now. I can understand the majority of, of what the characters are saying. I'm retired now, but I was, I was pretty amazed when I was at work. There was a row of filing cabinets between me and one of my coworkers. And she used to have to come around the filing cabinets and stand in front of my desk in order to talk to me. But with my cochlear implants, we could actually carry on a conversation from both of our desks. And I actually had to ask her to lower her voice because she talked too loud. I had another coworker that was clear across the room and I could also understand him. And it was not unusual for him to ask me to speak up because he couldn't hear me. And that's another thing that changed. So I used to talk pretty loud and I didn't know that I was talking that loudly, but I was. And now that I can hear at the same volume as regular hearing people do, I also speak at the same volume that they do. I can hear the difference now. I can also listen to my TV, my iPad, computer, and my phone, all at the regular volume. I used to have to use headphones to listen to the TV, and even having it at 100% volume was not enough for me to understand what was being said. Now the volume's at about a 30% level, on most shows and no more headphones. I remember my aunt used to send me videos on the computer to watch, but I could never understand them, so I'd just delete them. But I can understand them now. I can understand YouTube videos and everything else. And I was even able to wear earbuds on a self-guided tour that I was on, and I understood every word. So I understood, slowly understood more and more of what the stampers were saying. And that was probably the hardest part for me to understand. And I'm not sure if it was because I was concentrating on what I was working on and I was just so used to tuning them out or or what the situation was. Riding in a car is wonderful. I can sit anywhere and I can understand what the passenger is saying. I just returned from a trip to Monterey and I was driving and my passenger and I had conversations the entire way. And it's so wonderful to be a safe driver and not have to sit there and try to read lips at the same time that I'm driving. And one of the best things is that it's easier now. I don't have to concentrate anymore. I don't have to try to always read faces. I can share genuine emotion instead of the death nod. 
It takes a lot of work to read lips and it can be exhausting, but it's not like that anymore. I can actually look people in the eyes when they talk and not concentrate on their lips. And I hear lots of sounds that I couldn't hear before. I do hear those birds. I hear someone unlocking the front door when I'm in the other room. You can hear the doorbell when I'm in a back room, elevators, bells dinging. And I swear that my cat even talks to me more now. I think she realizes that I can hear her for a change. Listening to her purr is, is probably the best sound, my favorite sounds. I even heard Santa Claus. Yep, that's right, Santa Claus. I was standing on my porch, it was Christmas Eve, and I heard jingle bells. I, I, I can't possibly be hearing jingle bells. So I looked all around, and all of a sudden I heard, ho, ho, ho. So I looked down the street, and Sure enough, there was Santa Claus going into my neighbor's house, and he was halfway down the block. I never would have been able to hear that before. And I can also listen to music in my car again. I was getting to the point where I was going to have to stop. I wasn't sure what songs were on. Now, not only do I know what songs are on, but I'm picking up the lyrics of songs that I haven't even heard before. And I can also understand the computers and DJs talking, talk radio. So Dr. Show had recommended that I get my second ear done about six months after my first. Well, I didn't want to do that in the beginning, but the first cochlear implant turned out to be so great and my hearing aid turned out to be so bad that I decided I want to make both full use of the second ear too. So six months later, it was back to the operating room with my masterful surgeon. And boy, am I glad I did. One cochlear implant was great but two is amazing. My comprehension's even better, voices sound even better, and I can hear in stereo. And I now have the new Advanced Bionics Marvel processors that have Bluetooth. I can stream my music in full stereo and the phone and the TV streams directly to my ears as well. And the sound is amazing. And I have loved my cochlear implants so much that I became a volunteer mentor for Advanced Bionics in Dr. Shohat's office. I now help people along their journey, and I'm even chapter leader of the Orange County chapter of the Bionic Ear Association. And we have social gatherings to bring people together with Advanced Bionics cochlear implants, as well as those who are thinking about getting a cochlear implant. It's been wonderful to give back to people just like that couple did for Steve and me. And by the way, my brother, Steve, he has two implants too. His progress was slower than mine, which was to be expected. But his, his hearing history was not as long as mine. And he had been hearing impaired for 20 years longer than I was. That said, however, he has made great progress too. He's also hearing things and understanding things that he never thought he could. And he's become so much more social. I just can't tell you how grateful I am for this miracle. Not only have I dared to dream, but those dreams are really coming true. I truly hope that my story encourages those of you out there who are wondering if a cochlear implant is the next step. I know that you're going to find education and care in the team of medical doctors and audiologists at Showhead Ear Associates. I've gotten to know many of those audiologists over the year, years, and I'm, in, I'm honored to introduce one of them as our next speaker. Dr. Jacqueline Bybee. She's gonna discuss hearing loss and how to know when it is time to get a cochlear implant. Jacqueline. Okay, thank you so much, Julie. And thank you for sharing your story. I know it's been um, instrumental for many of my patients that are learning and bridging the gap from hearing aids to cochlear implant and um, you know many many thanks as always um, and for everyone else tuning in thank you so much for taking the time to come learn and uh, hopefully Julie's story um, resonated with some of you who have had progressive hearing loss in adulthood uh, and who may be wondering about cochlear implants. So we'll walk through uh, you know, some of the considerations for cochlear implants. Of course, this is always decided on an individual basis. Um, 
but we'll talk about some things to think about and, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, just a reminder for all of you that jumped in a little late, um, if you would like a live transcription of what I'm saying and it's not turned on automatically on your computer, you can activate it by clicking on the live transcript button on your Zoom toolbar and selecting uh, view transcript or enable auto transcription. Okay, and I'd like to start this section by uh, taking a little poll. Um, most of you, I imagine, who are listening wear hearing aids already um, or have a family member wearing hearing aids. Um, so I'd like to get an idea of where you are at in your hearing journey. Um, so if you can make a selection, either A, B, C, or D, as to whether you hear clearly most of the time, do you feel that you miss a lot, it's getting annoying, or do you find that sometimes you're pulling away from conversation or choosing not to go somewhere and do something because you won't be able to hear? And if you prefer not to answer or you're not quite sure, you can select D. We're waiting for that poll to be launched. <laughs> okay. Having some technical difficulties, it sounds like. Um, but either way, I just want you to kind of think about where you are at in that hearing journey. And um, that'll give us a ticking off point for today. Um, so a little bit of background about the remainder of the, uh, the talk today. Um, first of all, I'll mention there will be time for questions at the end here, um, about 20 minutes time. Uh, you'll have the option to ask either Julie or I uh, questions and we'll do our best to answer them for you. And so I'm going to talk about um, you know, what hearing aids can and cannot do for people with hearing loss. Um, and when it may be time to consider uh, hearing aid accessories or a cochlear implant. All right, so what can hearing aids do? So hearing aids work with a natural hearing system okay, to essentially amplify sounds. Um, of course, trying their best to uh, filter out background noise or focus on the primary speaker but we use the natural hearing system to do that, okay? So sound is collected either in the ear canal or from the hearing aid microphone. It's directed towards the eardrum, which vibrates the three smallest bones in the body, the ossicles, and sends the information to the fluid-filled cochlea. Okay, that's that snail-shaped structure you see on the screen there. The cochlea is the primary hearing organ and that's where the majority of hearing loss occurs, about 95%. Okay. From the cochlea, the sound goes up the auditory nerve to the brain, and ultimately we hear with our brains, right? We have to integrate all the different sounds we're hearing and try to differentiate the sounds. Um, for uh, Ashley, can you go back one slide for me? For those of you interested, uh, there's a very thorough and well done video on YouTube. If you search the phrase auditory transduction, Did that translated well, um, it's about an eight minute video that gives you a really great tour through the auditory system. Perfect. So Hearing aids can amplify sound. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about the cochlea today, knowing that um, you know, if there's a problem with the eardrum or the middle ear bones, that's often something that is treated medically, surgically, or pretty effectively with a hearing aid. All right, so within the cochlea, there's these little structures called hair cells. Okay, this is what's damaged with aging, noise exposure, combination of factors across the lifetime. And 
when you have severe hearing loss, the damaged hair cells look like they do on the right there, is like damaged blades of grass, yes? Um, so at a certain point, we can stimulate those hair cells, but if they're damaged enough, it's like turning up a bad speaker, right? You can turn it up, but it's not any clearer. Okay, so how do we overcome nerve damage? Two options. One, we try to improve what we call the signal to noise ratio. Okay, uh, we can do that by getting good hearing aids, hearing aids that automatically you know, try to filter the background noise and preserve the speech cues. And sometimes we'll add hearing aid accessories. We'll talk about that shortly, um, but whether that's a microphone or a streaming through Bluetooth, the goal is to give you a better signal, okay? So with hearing aid accessories, these are some examples, um, whether it be a microphone uh, that somebody speaks into, a communication partner in the car or in a restaurant that helps their voice be more amplified than all the surrounding noise. Uh, same thing with television, you can have it go directly into the hearing aids and in a public venue, some have what's called a telecoil or a loop system um, that helps many people in the audience uh, hear what the um, microphone, the person speaking into the microphone is saying. All right, so when these accessories, you know, they may help, but you know, my patient's saying, I'm still not able to participate or hear when I'm in church or, um, you know, go on that road trip that I want to go on because I know I won't be able to hear people. Um, that's when really the red flags come in for, okay, we need to think about something different. Your ear may be too damaged for hearing aids. Okay, so cochlear implants considered when hearing loss becomes severe enough that hearing aids don't give us the clarity that we need. Okay, so Julie showed you a picture of her cochlear implant. It's beautiful in red. Um, certainly they come in different colors, size, and shapes. Um, some are completely off the ear, as you see in the bottom right-hand uh, image, and some tuck over the top of the ear like most hearing aids do. Okay, the internal part is an implant, requires a surgery, and um, Dr. Shohat and the other surgeons um, help, help you pick your implant and we talk about, you know, what to expect and we'll talk about that a little further here. Okay. So first it should be noted that in general, cochlear implants are underutilized. Okay. A lot of people can benefit from cochlear implants and are either never referred for one or have concerns about them, which we're going to address here. Um, so worldwide, about 5% of those eligible will actually get a cochlear implant. And in the US, it's very similar. So 5 to 7% as of 2019. Okay. Again, this can be from lack of appropriate referrals. You know, even well-meaning hearing professionals try to hold on to hearing aids a little too long and you know, primary care physicians may not be aware of all the expansion of criteria for cochlear implants. So the first step is just getting to the right professionals and then answering any questions or concerns. And four of the most common concerns we're going to briefly discuss here, okay. Um, one group did a survey of patients who are eligible for a cochlear implant and ask them, you know, what are your concerns or why are you waiting? Why are you hesitating? Let's, let's really dig into this. So we'll talk about these four factors. Okay, so the first thing I hear come up is uh, fears about surgery. Okay, um, I've heard many a times, well, this is brain surgery, I'm not willing to do that. You know, um, assuming that this is a really invasive surgery, it is still surgery, mind you, but keep in mind that it's an ear surgery, not a brain surgery. Um, it's performed an outpatient procedure, so lasts a couple hours and then you go home for the day. 
Um, and as Julie mentioned, it is covered by most insurance plans. It is not uh, extremely painful. You know, again, it is surgery, so there's some minor pain at the implant site, um, but nothing extensive. And then it is not plug and play, meaning um, you know, it does not work right away. There's a healing period. And then typically within the first six months, we see the most growth in terms of speech understanding. So yes, uh, insurance does cover a cochlear implant, um, at least one, uh, depending on candidacy. Okay, and that's private insurance. Uh, Medicare covers one uh, at this point and uh, Medicaid as well. And the health insurance does follow, um, uh, it covers you know, the pre and post-op care as well, since it's not a one visit uh, surgery plug and play. So you need some follow-up and that's typically covered. Uh, candidacy is definitely expanding. So uh, we're now implanting patients that have single-sided deafness. They have normal hearing in their other ear. Um, perhaps they have some hearing in their other ear, so asymmetric hearing loss. Uh, cochlear implants now are hybrid, so say you have a little bit of hearing left, but not really any clarity. Um, we can fit devices that are part cochlear implant and part hearing aid. And while we don't talk too much about kids in this talk, um, you know, kids have definitely gotten cochlear implants traditionally as young as uh, one year of age, and that's recently been expanded down to nine months if they're born deaf. Uh, okay, so one other objection or question people have, this is probably the one I hear most commonly, is will I gain more than I lose? Okay, and what I mean by that is when we do an implant, you typically lose any residual hearing in your implant ear, okay? Um, typically that's not too much of an issue because one, you still have your other ear and two, you know, what you gain from um, your speech understanding is outweighs the negative of losing that residual hearing. Um, but it is something to consider, absolutely. Um, we have about 40 years of research now on benefits of cochlear implants, whether that's speech understanding, ease of listening, um, overall quality of life, just being involved in those conversations, like Julie said. And uh, we know that treating hearing loss properly is important for cognitive health. Um, in fact, untreated hearing loss is the number one modifiable risk factor in midlife for reducing the risk of dementia. So hearing aids, if they're appropriate, will you know, reduce that risk and a cochlear implant if appropriate will also reduce the risk. Will I gain more than I lose? Yes, I mean, speech understanding wise, you can hear what Julie gains. Um, of course, there's a range of outcomes and we talked to you about that beforehand. Um, you know, what do we expect based on your hearing history? Everyone's a little different. Um, recipients gain access to sound, similar levels of someone with a normal to mild hearing loss. And then the understanding or how well you hear clearly depends greatly on how long you've had hearing loss and how motivated you are to practice with your cochlear. You have to learn how to hear electrically and it's not, um, you know, it's not instant. You know, the more you practice, the better you will do. And Julie will be the first one to agree with that, I think. All right, so what's involved in post-implant uh, post rehabilitation? Again, the brain has to learn how to hear electrically. It's never done that before. So we recommend full-time wear during the day, just like a hearing aid. You take it off when you sleep, shower, and sometimes swim. There's ways to make them waterproof. But 30 minutes a day at least of dedicated listening practice, anywhere from you know, drilled speech sounds to listening to an audio book. Um, I think Julie's um, blog or Facebook page has daily exercises for listening uh, to keep things fresh. Uh, but yeah, that listening really, really 
um, helps determine success. And that dedicated practice is real important. Um, your audiologist would provide resources for self-paced learning. And um, some, some patients benefit from working with a speech pathologist, um, especially if they have a longer duration of deafness and uh, need to match that electrical sound with those speech sounds. So lots of resources. I'll review a few here. Um, one is a, a website and a group called the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. Um, that's our website there. Their members are uh, medical professionals as well as uh, educators, uh, people wearing cochlear implants, uh, parents for kids who are considering implants. Um, wide range of input there. Um, so great place to get current information. Um, our website has information as well, and that'll that'll come up in a second. Um, but certainly the first step is to schedule a consultation with your audiologist, um, see where you're at in terms of hearing with your hearing aids and see if you're a candidate for cochlear. Okay, excellent. Um, both Julie and I will be available to answer your questions. I'm gonna take a peek at our question list. And if you think of any questions now, uh, now's a great time to type that into the chat function, uh, which is on your toolbar for Zoom. You can type any question into chat and we'll try our best to answer it. I'm told we have no questions so far. Don't be shy. <laughs> As someone has asked if age is a consideration for candidacy, she said her mother is 83 and struggles with her hearing aids. That's a great question. Um, age is not a limiting factor. Uh, the main thing to consider is if, um, if the person is healthy enough to undergo a surgery. Okay, so... Um, I want to say Dr. Shohat's um, oldest implant was 91, very healthy 91, <laughs> very motivated. Um, you know, we want to make sure they're healthy, motivated, um, have family support, often very important. Um, so it is not a precluding factor age. It's really just if you're healthy enough and motivated enough to have the surgery. Someone asked um, to explain the loss aspect. If you can't adjust, is it reversible? No, it is not reversible. It is a permanent implant. Um, I have never seen a patient do worse with a cochlear implant than a hearing aid, um, provided they're a proper candidate going in. Um, yeah, never seen it happen. Um, you know, in less than 1% of cases, there. Uh, you know, an explant or re-implant um, could be possible, but again, that's extremely rare. Um, and that's, that's possible to have it taken out for any reason, but your hearing, if you lost your residual hearing, that would still, that would still be lost. So, I mean, we don't do this until people are real sure that that's what they wanna do. Someone mentioned um, how to use earbuds with a, with a cochlear. I can answer that one. Um, I have advanced bionics hearing aids, uh, cochlear implants, and there is a T mic. I don't know if you can see me, but there's um, there's a microphone that sits in the base of my ear canal, and so I just take the earbuds and stickly simply put them in, and it um, it bumps up to my microphone, and that's how I use the earbuds. Yep, and as Julie mentioned, um, a lot of implants now are Bluetooth compatible, so anything with sound can often be sent directly into the hearing device. That's an option too. Okay, someone asked to discuss the recovery processes with respect to Disney, dizziness and driving. You want to uh, take that one? 
Yep. So some yep. people have a little dizziness after surgery. Um, not everyone or most people, but some. Um, so we get baseline information on your, uh, your vestibular system in your ear, which helps you maintain your balance and prevent dizziness. So we know going in if there's a higher risk for that. Um, but most patients, if they have dizziness, resolves within the weeks after surgery. And they want to know what the estimated cost is? Um, so most insurance will, will cover it. If you pay out of pocket, it varies greatly, but uh, the vast, vast majority of insurance will cover it. Uh, someone wants to know what the negatives are. Uh, the main one is just if there's any residual hearing um, that you would that you would lose that. So you know, at nighttime, for instance, when you take the processor off, um, again, you still have your other ear, but you know, you could be losing some residual hearing that you use at night. So we make sure you know patients have vibrating alarm clocks. Um, you know, they're safe in their home, whether it's visual smoke detectors or you know, flashing smoke detectors or other things to maintain safety, especially if you live alone. So those kinds of things need to be considered, but that should probably already be in place before a cochlear implant if you have a severe hearing loss. So that's really the only negative. Um, and then just the fact that you have to have a surgery. And I can add that, that you have to be willing to put in the work. Um, it's not instant. And so it's something that um, if you're expecting it to just automatically work really well and you can hear fine the next day, that's not going to happen. It takes a lot of time and a lot of training. And so you have to be patient with it and you have to be willing to do the work. So the first six months or so can be pretty tough. It's, it's, it is hard um, for a lot of people, but the benefits are far outweigh any negatives. I I somebody asked, uh, how long is the surgery and how long is the recovery? Uh, yep, the surgery is itself is one to two hours, um, you know, with the time, of course, before and after surgery. But, you know, you'll go home within a half day. Um, and then the recovery, uh, Julie can talk a little more about that. But generally, there's some mild pain and, um, you know, rest. But yeah, you're activated two to three weeks later. And it, it took me um, about a week of staying home from work. Um, I, it didn't hurt. It, I, I didn't use the pain medication. I just used, uh, just took Tylenol. Uh, the first night is a little di bit difficult to sleep in the bed. I wound up sleeping on the recliner the first night. Um, I did have some loss of taste for about six months. Some foods tasted really bland. I could still taste chocolate, very, very good. <laughs> My jaw was a bit sore for a little while. Um, so those were the, the main things and that's pretty typical of what I hear from people. Your taste does come back, it did for me. Um, that the jaw was only sore for a few days. Um, some people do get a little bit dizzy yeah, but that's that's pretty much standard, I think, uh, for what happens after surgery. Um, someone else happens. What if they what if they have the surgery and then they don't use it and they understand that it's it's not um, reversible? If you put it in and you don't use it, basically you've lost that ear uh, in a nutshell. I mean, so it's kind of if you're going to go through the surgery and you're going to go through everything that you have to do to have the surgery, you've got to be willing to work on it. You have to be willing to work on it and you have to understand that it can take a couple of years before you are really getting a good benefit. So you have to be willing to do that. Yes, I would echo what you said about the knee surgery. Um, you know, why have a knee replacement if you're not going to do the therapy afterwards? Um, same kind of thing for the ear. You we talk extensively about what's involved ahead of time so that that issue doesn't come up, that it's just implanted and not used. Okay, one person, I, it's not really, I'm not sure. They said one ear natural sound and another cochlear sound. I, I can tell you from 
I, I'm bilateral, so that means that I have two cochlear implants. But I can tell you that in the beginning, the sound that I got from, oh, I, I can explain it from my brother, actually. When he was first implanted, if you're familiar with Star Wars at all, he heard beeps for speech. So he said it sounded like R2-D2. And then it changed to C-3PO, which was a more robotic sound. And now I sound like Princess Leia. So I'm, I'm human again. So you do have a human sound. Um, again, it takes a little bit of time. And then your other ear would just sound natural and it helped to balance that out. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, and I wonder if the question was potentially, um, you know, how does it sound having a cochlear implant in one ear and a hearing aid in the other, one ear being electrical and the other acoustic? Um, and it's a great question. I, when we think about, you know, those two things working together, it, it shouldn't work as well as it does, is kind of the short answer. <laughs> uh, you know, if you still have enough hearing in your other ear to use a hearing aid, it, it does definitely supplement um, the cochlear implant, it, often in a good way where it adds some fullness or music sounds a little better, uh, having one of each. Uh, but ultimately, yes, if you're a candidate in both ears for a cochlear um, that's always advised, but most of my patients, the vast majority wear one of each. And again, it's, it works quite well. The brain integrates the information and not right away, but it's very adaptive. <laughs> hey, someone says that I, I heard from moderate to severe hearing loss, there's a new technology called ear lens, which implants a lens in your ear. Any comments? I believe Dr. Showhead is gonna have a whole presentation on that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That'll be the next um, listen and learn presentation. Um, the ear lens, a uh, short answer, is, is not a replacement for a cochlear implant. It's for people with a little bit you know, moderate to severe loss, whereas a cochlear implant is severe to profound, so less hearing um, to work with for a cochlear. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone asked what the round thing is on the person's head. Does anything go through the skull in order to get to the cochlear? I can show you that. This is what my processor looks like. I, I don't know, I can't see the screen, so I'm not sure what you're seeing, but this part right here has a, um, a magnet on it. This is called the universal headpiece. And inside um, where I was surgically implanted, there is a piece that has a magnet on it. This connects to that piece so now when this is connected, then I can hear. And so this part is the actual computer part. This part is the battery. I happen to have the larger battery because I put it on in the morning and it lasts until I go to bed and I charge it while I sleep. So this is the battery. This is the computer. Mine has a microphone here. And then this is the part that connects to the internal implant. So right now I can't hear in this ear because this is not connected. But as soon as it's connected, then I can hear again. Of course, with the battery on. <laughs> okay, so that's what that is. Um, Someone asked about the name of the group, um, the Advanced Bionics group. So Advanced Bionics is the manufacturer of the, the implant that I have. And we do have social gatherings. Um, if anyone is interested, you can maybe give, uh, and I can give you an email and you can, um, you can write to me and I can invite you to our socials if you'd like. I know we have one coming up in August in, Anaheim, I think it is. Um, so you're welcome to come and, and you would meet with other candidates and, and other um, people that have cochlear implants as well. So I can give you my email and you can, I'll add you to the list if you'd like to come to that. It's called the Bionic Ear Association. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, I just put my email in there. And I'm also a mentor. So during this journey, it, it helps to have someone that um, 
has been through it before, that understands where you're coming from and can help you along the way. Um, so I'm happy to help you with any kinds of questions that you have from a person's perspective that's been through it. I can't really give you medical advice, but I can help you understand if you know what you're hearing is normal or any questions that you may have. I'm happy to help. And someone asked, is it possible that it may not work after the implant? And what would happen if that was the case? Yeah, again, the implant failure rate is um, significantly below 1%. So while it happens once in a blue moon, it's very rare. And it can be re-implanted if something ever happened. I think we've answered all the questions that have been asked so far. Are there any other questions? So we'll show you some resources here. Um, everything from our website. Um, there's a request an appointment online feature on the website. Um, or of course you can call our office. Uh, Julie's book is a great place to start. Uh, called I Dared to Dream, and you can get that on Amazon. Um, she has provided, I believe, oh, her email is in the chat. Wonderful. And she's a great, great uh, resource. If you just want to know what it's like going through the process. Um, we have a few mentors. So if you have um, a little bit different of a situation, say you have a sudden hearing loss in just one ear, um, or you know a different kind of hearing history. We have multiple patients that are, have volunteered kindly to be mentors, um, you know, varying in age and experience. So we can certainly set you up with a, a good match. Any other questions? Well, thank you again so much for taking your time to to learn with us and. Um, Happy to meet with any and all of you or family members um, to discuss if this is a good option for you and um, address that on an individual basis. So thank you again so much. And uh, if Juliet's still here and has anything to say to wrap it up, uh, wonderful. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll take off here. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you, Julie uh, and Jackie, and we'll be sending an email out with a recording of this presentation. So feel free to watch it uh, again at your leisure, share with family and friends. And also we'll have a little more information about the August webinar that's coming up with Dr. Jack Shohet, um, talking more about hearing loss and some breakthrough hearing technologies. So thanks to everybody who put this together and thanks to everybody for participating today. We look forward to seeing you again in August. I, I do have one last thing to say, I forgot. Um, I will be giving another presentation in September as part of your series um, on what you can expect and um, basically what, what rehab, how, the importance of rehab. Terrific, thank you, Julie. Appreciate all your help. And uh, again, stay tuned, more information coming soon and have a great weekend, everybody.